Ah, salut l'ami <laughs> Today we're going to talk about your, your new map. Yeah. Which we actually alluded to uh, in the past two episodes. Yeah, because we talked about the two corner maps of the main map. Exactly, right? Uh, and today we're going to talk about the mainframe one. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the common theme in, in this map play that you have is uh, genetics, which is a contentious issue. Yeah. It's a, it's a sensitive issue today. Yeah. Uh, but the way you've done it um, yeah. really shows the diversity. Yeah, we're not trying to really classify them by like physical traits. We're just showing that like these are all markers just to show, oh, there's these differences. But like on this map, you don't know what those differences actually look like. But at, at the same time, it's telling you what those differences are. So, right. you know, it's it's a it's a it's a weird one. It's it's the best way, I guess, I could figure out how to talk about. Mm hmm. About so the way you, um, I guess, divided the genetic pool of humanity yeah. is within these 24 clusters. Yeah. Right? Well, these would be 24 clusters of shared similarities. Because there's no person who is of just... shared similarities. Yeah, yeah of shared, so, but there's no one person who's this one of these. These aren't right. races. Yeah. These are things that would show up in your spectrum, mm -hmm. in your profile. Mm -hmm. yeah. So each person would have a spectrum of maximum 24 clusters. Someone could have all 24. Maybe. Potentially, yeah. right? And then it's a balance, a spectrum. Each yeah. individual will have a yeah. Most particular like, uh, range of... Yeah. Most likely people have like five, six, seven Australian Aboriginals or people like the Kalash in like the Hindu Kush or is it like Tianjin Mountains, like um, Pamir Mountains. Those people are almost 100% that, that like one or like there's maybe two clusters that show up. Mm -hmm. But it's very rare for mm -hmm. So maybe let's dive into um, um, into the main map. Yeah. So yeah, w w what we're looking at here are profiles, right? From a select um, sample, like uh, there's 125 profiles, and um, these the bars underneath them kind of show you what that profile spectrum is on average for the population. So we're doing it by a country level, and we're pretending that there's some kind of uh, bureaucracy around the world that has been able to collect an equal like a an extensive enough and fair sample of the world population because usually the problem with these methods is that the data is skewed based on the limits of their sampling right we're pretending and the way we're pretending is by me combining all these different researcher uh, researchers uh, material and their data into one big one kind of using a bit of a qualitative approach right there's some interventions on my part but i would say it mm -hmm. does justice or it honors what a lot of people are finding mm -hmm. so maybe if we look at the color scheme okay um maybe let's start with africa so you have um you have seven clusters yeah, which you're blue. representing in these different shades of blue and they're these clusters have a geographical location yeah attached to them right right so how did you determine those specific areas? That's the problem. So the weird thing is these the way that these um, uh, clusters appear on the map, it's actually a non-map. So the only uh, geographic reference that is geographic would be the samples. So those black dots are geographic reference points, but those um, colored uh, clusters, it's just uh, for people to kind of imagine uh, an association, but it's not scientific and it's not, it's not actual to be taken for... Because there's no, it's not an origin point. It's not to say that uh, what I call Ghanid is people like, like they didn't originate there. I'm not trying to say that, but I'm saying this is an area where there's a high concentration of that, um, right? And the Mediterranean thing, it's not saying that people originated ar around the Strait of Gibraltar. I'm just saying this is a good way to show that that uh, cluster is common on both sides of the Mediterranean. Okay. Where you placed the, um, these blurs yeah. would be um, a general location where yeah. I guess there is a lot of similarities in in people's genetic markers. Yeah, like a concentration. So it'd be a like concentration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but okay. it's just association. It's it's not to say that people who inhabit, like for example, Formosid and Oceanid, those might be more like me saying origin. But so it's a balance between where people, where the markers originated and where they're concentrated. So, um, 
Yeah, it's it's. I actually don't have a perfect methodology for that. It's it's mm-hmm. just a, a balance of that. For example, we do kind of know. It's really interesting. We do know where the Polynesian and Southeast Asian markers seem to be have come from. From the papers I read, um, but they're no longer the main dominant trait. Uh, they're not no longer the main dominant manifestation, the profile in that area. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, maybe we can um, dive a little deeper and mm-hmm. and uh, maybe like explain a little bit why you chose those specific areas. Is okay. there like a reason? Okay, so... So, I mean, for example, like if we look at, uh, you know, the Mediterranean basin, mm-hmm. We have like the Europid and the Asiate. Asiated. Uh, Asiated. Asiated. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like when I look at this, the Europid. Yeah. The location makes me think of like the origin center, like in the European. Yeah. Groups, right. And the Asiated is more so, you know, like birth of agriculture. And, yeah. You know, so did you have that kind of idea in mind or? Yeah, there's a loose association, but at the same time, it would be wrong to do. Th- it would be. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. yeah. So um, that is kind of thinking like when humans migrated out of Africa, the first wave um, that went into Europe probably took that route. They took the Black Sea coastal route and went to the kind of uh, Danube basin and then maybe skirted across the Carpathian Mountains. So that's the kind of thinking behind that. Um, the other thinking with the Asiatid thing is that um, that's actually a very old, just like human area, right? Uh, and then the the Mediterranean, it really isn't too factual, other than the fact that the Moroccan findings are in Morocco, like the old, one of the oldest human remains. But really, it's just to show that it was just the best way to show. Like, I could have done Carthage like or Tunis to Sicily to Italy. So can we say that, for example, this map is the one which has the least amount of um, correlation with the real world? No, actually, it's the most accurate. The most accurate. Uh, except for areas. So all, all these genetic profiles are real. Like, I, I took real data and I just like uh, entered it into a data sheet. But like I did a spreadsheet, I looked at what they what they were reporting, their spectrums, and I, I copied them. But areas where there were changes in the Altera lore, let's say like northern Australia or parts of the Americas, what, what I call the Geminas, those areas where there wasn't population replacement or that drastic of like, you know, um, population loss, those areas you will see me making up the data. And the way I made up the data was I looked at comparable populations and looked at what their spectrums were. But actually, it's still hard because um, you can have populations side by side and have very different um, profiles. So you have to do a bit of a historical research and say who are related. Like, for example, let's, I compared the Ahomis and the Asami. It's very uh, ironic because the, they are, they're cognates. The name Ahom and Assam are the, the same origin. But the Assam in real life they were a Thai people who migrated to Northeast India and it became Indianized. Mm. But well, it's quite interesting that this Assami has quite a large uh, Asiated. Asiated, yeah. yeah. So Northern Indians have a lot of Asiated or Asiated. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing is the Thai, like the Thai royal family went to Assam and they met some of the last speakers of Assami. The, because Assami uh, became Asa, Assami, it became the like a Northeast Indian language related to Bengali. But there are some people who can still speak the Thai language. And that Thai language is a Southern Thai language, so closely related to modern day Thai. So the princess or the royal family representatives that went there could communicate with some of these mm-hmm. elders. And anyway, so you can see the two, the, those two related populations, you can see how they're wildly different in this profiles. If you go north to the Hindu Kush, you can see that, you know, the Wagers or what I call the city, they, they're no longer Turkic speaking. They have a Turkic um, a substratum. Mm-hmm. But they speak Tokarian B, which we have a lot of records of. So Tokarian B with a lot of Turkic. And so they're quite diverse. Yeah, so they're like an equal. So they might look like modern-day Kazakhs, which is basically what the Wagers are. The Wagers, some Wagers look even more European than Kazakhs. Because the Kazakhs migrated westwards old, like, more recently. Whereas the Wagers are like older Persian populations, mm. Persian, personal Turkic populations that mm. settled in the east. What's quite interesting um, is, for example, the Siamese here, which is the Closest to the Formosid, Formosid cluster yeah. um, doesn't have much of Formosid. Yeah, so Formosid in the, in the got um, wedged out. So basically, 
you can see those two populations, Oceanid and Formosid, both um, is more closely related to where they originated. But the problem is both of them moved out at this. They got pushed further. So it got multiple waves of migration. The Serid uh, markers basically pushed out these last two with that Oceanid one pushed out the Formosid. So you have multiple waves of migrations. And this is even before the Austronesian migration. They believe that the Austronesians are one of the final waves into like Indonesia, the New Santaro area that kind of uh, showcased that kind of genetic shift. But uh, before that, uh, people related to Austronesians. So it could be the Austroasiatic peoples. Um, they're, um, they're, uh, they share the Oceanid markers, but the Formosid marker used to be from the Malay Peninsula all throughout Southeast Asia, all, all, the, all the way to the Philippines. And now it's bi got bisected so that it only mostly is concentrated in the Andaman Islands and in Northern Philippines. And they're what we call mm. them the Grotos. But mm. a lot of Austronesians and a lot of Southeast Asians have small traces of these people. It's mostly concentrated mm -hmm. in the Malay Peninsula and the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah, what's quite interesting is your, let's say, Eastern Pacific. Yeah. Uh, is very much... Oceanid. Closer related to, like, I guess, mainland. Uh, no, no, they're all Oceanid. Yeah, but o so Oceanid would be Southeast like Asian. The, I mean, in Polynesian. real in real life, would be like the ancestors of the Austronesians. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, but 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 it was before Austronesians existed. But although in your Western Pacific, yeah, they're more closely related to the uh, Melanid or Melanesians. Yeah. Okay. The cool thing is actually Melanid. Is that actually uh, true? It's true. In, it's in true. real life, yeah, it's true. Oh, okay. So there was actually they call it a uh, horizontal impact. So the languages. The Austronesian languages of, like, let's say, coastal Papua and the Solomon Islands, those Austronesian languages are just, it's kind of like how people in, Af in Western Africa speak English. There's, it doesn't mean that there's a lot of English ancestry in Western Africa. It means some kind of period of contact, in this case, colonialism. But in that case, somehow Austronesians came, were more dominant, maybe culturally had more soft power. Their language is stuck, but there's little genetic contribution. So you can see in the Solomon Islands, they're quite what we call in our world Melanesian, but in my world, Melanesian actually is spelled differently. It refers not to their skin tuck color, but to curly hair. I wanted to put mm. the focus on the curly hair instead of the dark skin. I thought there was too much fetishization of skin tone. But uh, anyway, so so that that's reflection. And actually, so it's really cool. It's really interesting how the Formosa or the Negrito population are the only ones in Southeast Asia that got, really got displaced. All the other kind of um, early kind of founder effect populations in Southeast Asia, these like purples, mm -hmm. they were able to maintain themselves. Mm -hmm. Which, for, yes. For example, so, and, and so that replacement, I mean, if I just refer to the, to the like bottom right yeah. um, map, this is something that, for example, is not captured because it's too old. It's it's older, but yeah. it's um it's a population replacement which uh, it, was had significant. Yeah, but in this case, the problem, so population replacement. The way I did it is like percentage wise, like what the land, like the percentage of the land is of this population. But it's likely that uh, it was less violent. It's likely that the people who moved in were just uh, were able to outpopulate in the sense that they were farmers or they were like. So, or there were like hunter gatherers who maybe used like um, higher caliber tools or whatever. So they replaced the Formosa population out of like um, a different, like a technological gap maybe, but not through violence. It couldn't have been, it might, it might not have been conquest. We don't know, but it's, it's different from this kind of radical shift. It, it probably happened through waves and waves of migration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I kind of sidetracked you there. And then, okay, so for the Geminas and Americas, you have four clusters. You have four main clusters. Yeah, the Arctic one is actually one of the Where most... Where I guess the Arctic one is the one split. which overlaps. Yeah. yeah. And that's just because of the map projection. Yeah, but it's really cool is actually, uh, like, if you look at this in Northeast Asia, the Ainu actually are a distinct isolate population, but they are collapsed with the Serid. Like, if you look at just the Ser East Asia, the Ainu come out as very uniquely their own cluster. But when you look at 24 clusters for the whole world, that gets lost. The Ainu are related to these Northeast Asian people, but the Ainu, look at the difference. So Ainu would be around... The Yezo, Yezo. Ah, yeah, okay. okay. And look at the, the people in the Kamchatka Peninsula. Mm -hmm. The Kamchatka Peninsula people are the most related to Inuit, but the Arctic peoples. But they speak languages that are completely different from Inuit. So there was for a long time a group of people who inhabited both sides of the Bering Strait. So just in terms of color here, 
So in uh, North America, mm -hmm. so Tentria, it's a uh, it's it's a little hard to distinguish between the shades of red. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, like, so these have a little bit of Siberian influence, right? No, or no, it's uh, it's only like at the uh, and you'll see it. Okay, so I, this one here, yeah, high oh, That's Sarid. That's Sarid. No? no, no, the light, the light one, the light pink Wait. is Arctid. The dark red is Sarid. Yeah, no, so we have Siberian and then Sarid. Yeah, which you can actually see in in like the Sitantria. Yeah, some 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 of them. But these two, right? Yeah. And then this orange is Sintatriad, and then yeah. and then the this one here is Arctic. Yeah. So I mean, these four here, I guess these three here, yeah, would be uh, later migrations. Would be uh, I mean clusters from East Asia. Yeah. So right? the interesting okay. thing here is Siberid. Um, that that one is uh, I just did because it's associated with an uh, unidentified migration or wave of migration that's responsible potentially for the Athabascan language family. But um, the Sarah thing, it's, it just shows up. If you look at, um, uh, uh, so these are genetic markers, right? So there are some genetic traits that maybe don't evolve or don't change and are like holdovers. And so a lot of the peoples in the Americas share similar traits to people in East Asia, just by like, even if you try to categorize them, try to find, like, to just look at them with East Asians, you'll see a lot of shared, like they'll have a lot of shared connections. It doesn't, it, like that, like that red, that marker of Sarid doesn't necessarily reflect a later migration of East Asians there. That's why these profiles, they don't tell you everything. You have to, you have to look at them with historical context. Mm -hmm. Which uh, brings me to the next question. What um, was your thinking in choosing these particular points? I wanted to show the most uh, uh, different pop. I didn't want to show populations that were the same. So I wanted to show... Like for example, if you look at the Songhai, the Sosoni, and the Dog Dogoni or Dogoni, or so that ref reflects the Dogon and the Songhai peoples in the Niger Delta. The Dogon um, miraculously have an uh, overwhelming majority of what is responsible for the Berber, Sicilian, and Southern European markers called Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and this is real. And so it, it, it's it's just fascinating that right beside them you have these people who are either Ghana or Ghanaian or you know, even Sahara, right? Like, so I just wanted to show geographic proximity and, and do irony. I wanted to use irony to show diversity, right? Like you go like, oh, I thought it would be like this, but it's not this, right? I wanted a lot of that. So every time I, I, I tried to pick peoples that would look different. And I also tried to show the typical profiles. For example, someone would be like, hey, what is an Arab? What's an Arab's a person's a marker? So the, the closest thing you would see is the Maganians. But even here, I actually didn't do it too well because the Maganians have some East African that happened due to colonial histories between Oman and East Africa. But like, like Hejaz might not even have any of that. So it might be more of the Erythrid. But I tried to show like at least one population in each area that was typical mm -hmm. um, um, of one of these traits. So who represents the Erythrids the most, right? The Arabs or, or uh, people of the Red Sea represent Erythrid the most. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this Wagali is is what like Kyrgyzstan. They, yeah, yeah, they they, they uh, or the tribals Afghanistan. Oh, so, okay, so northern territory. Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so Dardid, like uh, Dardid is yeah, yeah, Dardic is a divergent Indo-European branch. Dari is language spoken in. Uh... No, it's not Dari though. Dari is a Persian dialect. Dari is a divergent language of Persian. Dardid is a European term for uh, okay, a so divergent group of Indo-Europeans who are their own branch. Anyway, so uh, the Kalash and the Bur Burushaki, these people are very isolated people of like Eastern Afghanistan that um, maybe they don't even look that different. Like they, they do for Europeans, they look a lot like Europeans, um, but they also have typical features that you find in North India and like, you know, uh, like Persia or Iran. But the interesting thing is that their genetic markers are very isolated from other genetic markers. So they, it manifests quite, um, quite clearly as its own. So uh, Rosenberg, uh, you know, the, that Rosenberg study that have 1,000 peoples, they found this as a seventh cluster. If you divide the world into seven clusters, Dardic or these people as uh, the seventh one, which shows quite, a, quite an ancient divergence. Mm -hmm. Which is actually quite interesting because it's a part of the world which has seen a quite lot, a lot of, mix. A lot of mix, but actually it's a little more north yeah. and it's in the mountains. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, 
And you can mm. see right beside them is the Ladakh people who have no dart, like very little dart contribution. Yeah, concentrating in the Gwagali and yeah. some of the populations around have a tiny little bit. Yeah, like Bactrian, but... which makes sense. But um, like, so they, so also Wagali have very little in comparison with it. The, like they have very little Asian. So just uh, to like, just because I'm curious, like Wagali refers to a particular people. Yeah. So in my world, it's called Wagalistan. Okay. But Wagali, I think I got that term uh, off as being just like a, one of the subgroups of the um, Kalash people. People that people would know that are related to these are uh, the people who are in Kashmir. And just some things that are kind of fun to look at are like areas where you're like, oh, how did all these things get lumped together? For example, with the Malagasy people, this is just natural. This is just historical. The Malagasy are Austronesians and they, you know, just it's a marriage between them and the Bantu migration. So that's responsible for that. Mm -hmm. And in that dark purple that ended, it's just me. That's just me in my Altera showing some Indian contact. Okay. Um, but you also have a little bit of Asiated in here. Oh, it, it, would, it would make sense. It, 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 it comes from like Arabs. Right. And, but on and, the mainland of, of Africa, I guess you have a little less. Oh, although the Namibians and the Angolians have some. Hmm. Well, no, no, Nam Namibians are a mixture of Europeans. So, so okay. they're the Orlams people. That's a light green. That's a Europid. Right, right, right. What's really cool here is if you look at Lhasa Divi, it, it's a foreshadow of my plans. So Lhasa Divi, uh, Amlu Divi, and in the Christmas Island and Cocos Islands on the other side of the Indian Ocean, I decided for those would be a repositories for the Onge, uh, Onga and uh, Andamanese or Great Andaman languages. So there's two language branches, two isolate language branches in the Andaman Islands. Onga or Ongan and uh, Amundin, Great a Great Amundin. Um, and uh, I I don't necessarily need to have their whole populations get moved, and it, it would be really bad to do that. But there was a history of Europeans taking Indians to go farm in, let's say, Mauritius, right? Mauritius is Amludiv. You can imagine Europeans going to the Andaman Islands instead and bringing them over, some of these peoples getting captured, which, you know, was terrible. But what I'm doing here is at least representing the languages on the brand, on the map, because what's happening is all like the Ongan and Greater Amadin languages uh, are both uh, critically endangered. They're they're about to go extinct, and uh, in my world, that area is a non-territory. It's a society of nations territory. Those languages might exist there, but I'm saying I want also the power of the state to bring two or three of those languages to become official languages in, ter in other territories. You can see Lassadivi has genetic contributions from the Formosa population of the Andaman Islands. Damn, yeah, this map really takes some time to uh, to really appreciate this map. You really have to dive deep and, yeah. and look at the individual profiles and take a step back. And it really shows you how how much of a, of a spectrum humanity is. Right? Yeah. And we come from everywhere and Every population has its own unique combination of yeah, and there's a narrative explained for those differences yeah. yeah, and why they show up. What's really cool is like I think you know so basically people who are buying those ancestral kits twenty three me ancestry dot com I couldn't do that. You could because their sample po population is mostly Europeans, so you, they would be they would be able to tell me that so I'm East I would, Asian. I would have more. Um, They'd be able to go like you have this much Frisian, this much North German, this much whatever. They're that good now. Yeah, for for Western Europe. Yeah, because their po sample population yeah, is all is European, large. all Western. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to show that like because Europeans are like hyper focused on the diversities amongst themselves, and they like think that that's everything. Yeah, but it's like, and I mean, it's I, that actually skews the, yeah. the picture so much. Yeah, because like you're showing. The genetic diversity within Europe is actually quite limited. There is such um, a skewed um, weight in yeah. terms of the number of samples, genetic samples. Yeah. There's like a, a disproportionate uh, weight given yeah. to Europeans. Yeah. And and, uh, and it's from the narrative and, and that and Europeans are special too. But with time, yeah. as these sample pop populations become bigger and bigger and bigger, then you can start telling the, the differences in the other parts of the world, yeah. which you have actually kind of started to do by yeah. researching and reading all these like cutting yeah. edge genetic studies. Yeah. I mean, obviously what I'm doing is going to be uh, me me methodically flawed. People are going to criticize it for that. And that's okay. 
I'm just trying to project what I believe the studies will in the future show us. I am quite mm-hmm. certain that I'm like, like for the areas where there's no changes between the real world and Altera, I'm quite certain with the 80%, 90% accuracy that I like. So for example, what would those areas be? Okay. All of uh, Eurasia. Okay. And all of mostly Africa. Okay. So like, like if you look at the pop ones, like look, look at Niasi, this little island here yeah. has more of the oceanic marker than Aust- Austronesians. Polynesians carry a lot of the, of, of the Sarid. Uh, markers what are called like east asian markers they ca- carry a little bit the maori actually carry very little as well but basically they still carry a little bit of that but the niasi who are who migrated and became their own austronesian cluster um uh, language group and like eth- ethnicity before the polynesians became a thing they have they have a similar mm. kind of profile circassians who look very european are mostly of this Asiatid thing, which shows you that the, the difference between Europeans and Asiatid is not what you think is the difference. What you might think as a difference being phenotypical, like hair color and skin tone is different because like Circassians are known to be like very, or like they're fetishized, right? The mm-hmm. Ottomans fetishize them for having really pale skin or whatever. Mm-hmm. So yes, uh, I mean, that brings to the forefront the issue of, um, or the term Caucasian. Yeah, because nowadays Caucasian it's is kind European. of used to represent all white people. Yeah, uh, but I actually I was actually looking at, uh, yeah. into that uh, last week. Caucasian mm-hmm. in the Middle Ages was so before you know the theorization of of, of race of race yeah. uh, was a term to represent um, a beauty yeah. because the people of those regions would considered really beautiful. Yeah. So with time, that term beauty versus it was beauty, yeah. then it got associated to whiteness. Yeah. Modern day Arabs from the Middle East yeah. are technically more closely related to, to the Caucasus yeah. than uh, white people from the US. What I really want to highlight is a skin tone is a bad way of understanding yeah. the genetic differences. And, like, and I think that's really what people have a yeah. problem understanding. Un- unlearning. Yeah. But okay, just check it out. A really, like, people who are deep in West Africa, okay, the Dogani people. Have that Mediterranean marker, and almost it, more than fifty percent. Yeah, like pretty and much. 50%. And the Numidians, so Tunisians, Sicilians, Greeks, Turks, they have that marker as a majority as well in their populations. Okay, mm. maybe less so, but a majority. So it's telling you that this Mediterranean thing isn't responsible for the skin tone, right? Something else is something mm-hmm. very minor, something small. Same with Asian blonde blondism exists from Ireland all the way to the Hindu Kush. So blondism, fair hair, fair, uh, um, like light hair and fair skin exists across many of these clusters. It's not just the Europeans who are. This kind of blonde hair thing evolved twice outside of Europe. Europe, it evolved mm-hmm. once. And we fetishize this thing so mm-hmm. much. But Melanesians have blonde yeah, hair. But it evolved separately from the Austro- uh, Australian Aboriginals. So there's two markers in the South, one marker in Europe. And when Europeans look at Melanesians or, or, or look at Australian Aboriginals, they actually have a no way of judging beauty because they think of beauty as associative. They think of blonde and white skin as beautiful. But when you look at a dark skinned person with blonde hair, your mind automatically, I'm assuming for white people, is that they don't pay attention and they go like, oh, that's a weird oddity and they ignore it. Or they don't, they, go, they might go like, oh, it's dyed. Or they don't even think about it. They don't even see it. They just see the Australian Aboriginal and they don't even pay attention to the hair. And it just tells you how much hair color is fetishized in European, like in that European context. If you have no longer the ability to pers- to, to have the cultural context of reading that trait, it no longer means anything. So for these Europeans to look at these Australian Aboriginals and not apply the same beauty standards really shows you beauty is relative. Like, you know, long necks, um, flattened foreheads, hooped earrings, you know, hooped uh, those um, labrets in the lips. All of these things... We have no ability of really gauging because we're so stuck in our context. If we get moved out of those contexts, we'd automatically have no reference point. What are the most trivial things are not representative or not represented in the spectrum that we're trying to show here. Mm -hmm. Which is quite refreshing. Like people are interested in seeing what how people look differently, but this map is not exactly going to satisfy that. It's going to tell you, yes, people look different, but you, you, it's hard to give you the ingredients for them to imagine. Mm-hmm. But th- this is just so you're kind of dissociating here ideas of physical characteristics yeah. to 
you know, genetic origins or yeah. clusters of yeah. similarity. Yeah. The similarities don't have, or these clusters that you represent don't have, are not associated with particular physical traits. Yeah. But the just ones that we pay attention of to. Origin. The ones that we pay the most attention to. Okay. It might actually result in things like skin, uh, like uh, toes. For example, the uh, Greeks are famous for have noticing that North Africans, Asians, and Europeans have different toes. And it's it's the whole thing about the second, well, how, uh, the second um, toe, the second toe being a different length. It might actually be true. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But I'm saying back then they noticed that, mm. right? It might be like earlobes. One thing that's actually quite noticeable is earwax. Like East Asian populations are almost all and eyelids, but East Asians have no earwax. Did you know this? I didn't. So I always thought earwax was metaphorical, but earwax is, it doesn't, <laughs> the Europeans have this gross, greasy yeah, earwax, really? or the majority of the population in the world does. Yeah. East so Asians, you don't have, you don't, we need, have dead skin. It's you, dry. You don't have to use a, no, we do, but it's, it's dry, dead skin. Oh. It's not waxy. So when I saw Shrek and saw that wax thing, I thought it was to play on the word wax. I didn't know that literally people actually oh. had oily wax <laughs> or waxy like things in yeah. their ears. Yeah. Well, I have that. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, so it might be things like that that yeah. are super. Interesting. It might be like blood cells, um, you know, uh, if all kinds of things like uh, predispositions to certain kind of diseases. But it's not what we think is responsible for differences. Mm -hmm. We're not going to showcase all like it's really well worth the time to look at these profiles. Cause Wait, so just uh, I'm curious. So. Uh, do you have like a spreadsheet? Yeah, I do have to, a spreadsheet. To represent like these profiles? Yes, I do have a spreadsheet. So do you have them like uh, percentage wise? Percentage, percentage. By okay. uh, of 100%. Yeah. Oh, no, 100%. Yeah. Okay, cool. Did you have to omit? Like, yeah. what was your threshold of percenting? Well, you? okay. So um, I, I didn't have to admit too much because a lot of these genetic studies, they were hyper focused on a region. So they would have different clusters. So I would go like, okay, what clusters are collapsed? If I, if we take it to the world scale, so the Assamese, for example, it looked at just like maybe South, a South Asians, right? And they had more categories, more clusters because they were looking at South Asians. So they would look at Europeans, Africans, East Asians. They would have those three. They would have a Nigerian population, an English population and a Chinese population. And they would have a hyper diverse amount of Indians. And that way they were able to look at how, how uh, a lot of Indian clusters. But if you take it in a global scale, a lot of those clusters will collapse into each other. So that's one way I was able to mm. kind of um, not have to omit. Mm -hmm. So things would omit by themselves. They would get collapsed into each other. So I had to do some combination. I would go like, oh, these two colors, they actually are combined. I would have to do that kind of judgment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really worth... Um Diving in yeah. and looking at the profiles. Yeah. And actually, the best would also be to follow it with the spreadsheet you have on the website. Yeah, on the, the spreadsheet, website. which I'm going to put on Patreon, but also... On Patreon yeah, only. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to also put the references. All my references, okay. I'm going to put on Patreon. But basically, I think I just, I'm just i encouraging people to look at all these studies. Like, to look into African genetic statistics or, uh, or what they call structure analysis. To look into the uh, Americas, indigenous populations, or to look into Oceania you will be fascinated by all these things. Um, but mm. this is a this is a way for people to jump into it, to be curious, right? Mm -hmm. And I want them to look at this map, interact with it, and discover. I want them to have a discovery yeah. moment. It's cool because, you know, like a lot of um, maps which, you know, try to represent these really complex genetic studies yeah. usually are, are quite poor. Yeah. And so in this case, it's a very illustrative map. Yeah. which is kind of like a gateway yeah for you to then you know dive deeper into these like studies yeah. and into the material and all that exactly and this is kind of like a compromise between something that's fictional. beautiful okay. to look at fictional yet very much grounded in kind of like cutting edge yeah research it's helped me look at the world and in, in a much more um logical way Maybe you could say logical in the sense that um, you can you can look at every part of the world without any kind of prejudice or or bias or bias yeah. or just look at it in a way. It's like, oh, OK, well, every part of the world is worth exploring in its entirety. Exactly. Rather than it being on the margins and, and is as rich as any other part. If you spend enough time looking at the history and, and the geography and the yeah. geography, of yeah. course. 
Anyway, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. We All have right. a spot of wine. Yeah, man.